All right, y'all, we back at it. This is uh, the continued uh, dialogue from the uh, from the encyclopedia about some of the history of boxing. All right, so the article continues. Remember, we left off with the, the Queensbury Rules and the National Boxing Association recognizing another. What, if you go back to the video, you, you'll hear the last few words. But anywho, the article continues. Boxing in America, early development. Boxing made little progress in America until at least 100 years after its beginnings in England. The sport first gained prominence in the South, where slaves were pitted against each other by plantation owners who had learned of fist fighting through sons' education. By plantation owners who had learned of fist fighting through sons educated in England. So when you see scenes like in that of Django and um, the James Brown biopic, and I'm sure plenty of other movies, that, that's what it's um, alluding to. All right, the article continues. This may also explain why bare knuckle fighting persisted in America until 1892, 20 years after it had been abandoned in England. It was discontinued largely because John L. Sullivan, holder of the bare knuckle crown, decided to fight under the Queensbury rules. So I guess John L. Sullivan was tired of all that wild, you know, 50 round knuckle getting scraped and broke. And there's a caption here on the left yard. It's, it's talking about heavyweight champions. It says that um, heavyweight champions have fought by marquee under Queensbury rules since 1892. Then it talks a little bit about James A. Corbett and John L. Sullivan, Jack Dempsey, Gene Tunney, etc. All right, but the article continues. The first recorded prize fight in the United States occurred in 1816 when Jacob Heyer defeated Tom Beasley in a so-called grudge fight. Heyer claimed the title on the strength of his victory, but never fought again. <laughs> and the championship remained vacant until his son, Tom, claimed it in 1849. So this dude, Hire, basically one of them dudes, the wolf, 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 only got one good punch, or for whatever reasons, a dude that, that won something big and quit right afterwards, not proving it, not um, defending it, and then later on his son came and, um, came and claimed it in 1849 now the article that says claim they don't say one it says claim but let's 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 continue on even before the higher beasley fight however an american ex-slave tom mullino fought tom crib the english champion at cop tall common in 1810 for the heavyweight title mullino was defeated in the 33rd round. Most famous of the early international matches brought together Tom Sayers, British champion, and John Camel Heenan, American title holder, in 1860. They fought in England, and the match was not stopped until after two hours and 20 minutes of bloody combat. The referee besieged by followers of both men declared it a draw. The bout prompted a print by Courier and Oz. So these dudes were going at it, blood, tooth, and nail. And and I guess they're beating each other to a bloody pope. No man wanting to give up. Obviously, somebody's a little weaker. There's probably been a few knockdowns. But when the ref called a halt, both sides were saying that they man won. So as the article just said, what to say, besieged by followers of both men, the ref says, shoot. I don't want to see this other dude's corner after this, and I don't want to see these fans after this. So, flush it. It's a draw. Continuing on. During this era, Andy Bowen and Jack Burke fought for a total of 7 hours and 19 minutes in, in NOLA, in New Orleans, or as the article states, in New Orleans, in 1893. It was the longest bout on record and ended only when the two combatants can continue no longer. In contrast, there are many fights on the modern records, all between comparative unknowns. 
which ended 11 seconds after they started. Because of the 10 second knockdown rule, a fight can hardly end sooner. So there's been some 11 second fights, I guess y'all. Ding, 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 wop. 10 seconds later, ding, ding, ding. Continuing on. In America, the London prize ring rules obtained until Sullivan and Corbett fought for the championship in 1892. The Queensbury rules then brought order to the sport, however, and set the stage for the present day code, which was framed by W.A. Gavin, an Englishman who had come to America after World War I in the interest of the sport. His first choice as matchmaker for the International Sporting Club was Tex Rickard, who broke with Gavin and launched the so-called Golden Age of Boxing by matching Jack Dempsey over a period of years against the world's best heavyweights. So these sound like the first two promoters, um, if I'm not mistaken, you know, y'all help, help us out, correct? Uh, sounds like W.A. Gavin and Tex Rick, who were like the first big, you know, Don King, Bob Arams uh, of, the, of the boxing world in the early 1900s, late 1800s. Continuing on, heavyweights. Heavyweight fighters dominated boxing throughout its early days and still do to a great extent. Those fighters who have held the world heavyweight title since the adoption of the Queensbury rules are listed here. All right, J John L. Sullivan. John L. Sullivan must be mentioned first since it was he who held the World Bare Knuckle Championship in 1892 when he fought James A. Corbett for the new boxing crown. And here is the caption of a uh, quote unquote the famous long count which is the second um, Dempsey Tunney fight in Chicago in 1927 and it has, a, it has a description talking about the long count so on and so forth alright let's flip the page alright continuing on James J. Corbett became the first quote unquote Queensbury heavyweight world champion on September 7th 1892 by defeating John L. Sullivan in 21 rounds in NOLA, or New Orleans. Robert L. Fitzsimmons, aka Bob Fitzsimmons, took the title from Corbett on March 17, 1897 by 14th round knockout in Carson City, Nevada. James J. Jeffries became world champion on June 9, 1899 by knocking out Fitzsimmons in the 11th round of a fight in Coley Island, New York. He retired undefeated in 1905 so we gotta look that up y'all James J. Jeffries it said he won the world t title 1899 in Coney Island New York and he retired undefeated in, in 1905 so that means he went with six more years of heavyweight boxing raw dog Queensbury rules might be 12 rounds might be 30 and he went undefeated I'm a little skeptical but hey we're just gonna go over what the cyclopedias say by now all right, continuing on. Tommy Burns was matched with Marvin Hart to determine the successor to Jeffrey's relinquished title. So when he retired, Jeffrey's relinquished his title. Burns won a 20-round decision bout from Hart and claimed the heavyweight crown on February 23, 1906. Jack Johnson, the first Negro to win the heavyweight championship, gained what was referred to as the technical championship by stopping Burns in 1908. He won the actual championship by defeating Jeffries, who was trying for a comeback in Reno, Nevada, July 4th, 1910. So they say he technically won it by knocking out Burns, and then he won the actual championship by beating Jeffries, who came back after, remember, Jeffries retired in 1905, but he, I guess he was, they saying he's still like champion um, emeritus or something because he retired as the champion and undefeated. But who succeeded the belt, Tommy Burns succeeded the title. You correct me if I'm wrong. Jack Johnson beat him and was the champ. But the champion emeritus, which is Jeffries, came back and got whooped down in 1910. So I don't know if that makes Jack Johnson a double champion or they were just trying to look for ways to thwart him because... If Jeffries would have beat Johnson, they probably would have been like, oh, the old champ came back. Y'all know how the politics go. All right, continuing on. Jess Willard, 
knocked out Jack Johnson on April 5, 1915 to earn the heavyweight crown. It took him 26 rounds to do so, and he received only training expenses for his efforts. So damn, and I think Jess Willard is, is a Caucasian white dude. So he knocked out the champ, Jack Johnson, in 1915, and is saying that the prize money he got was only for expenses. He only received training expenses for his efforts. So they was doing the jerk move, you know, the long con, even back then. Next, you got Jack Dempsey. All right, y'all, it's going through all these heavyweight champions, okay? Uh, I'm just going to name them and not read their whole story. So in the lineage goes, all right, we just ended with Jess Willard, then Jack Dempsey, a.k.a. William Harrison Dempsey in parentheses, Gene Tunney, a.k.a. James Joseph Tunney in parentheses, Max Schmeling, you know, the, the German dude, um, Jack Sharkey, Primo Carnera, Max Bayer, Jim Braddock, Joseph Lewis Barrow, a.k.a. Joe Lewis, Ezra Charles, Jersey Joe Walcott, Rocky Marciano, Floyd Patterson, Ingemar Johnson, Floyd Patterson, and then it ends with Charles Sonny Liston. In that date that he won um, the title is 1962. So this encyclopedia is up to date because this encyclopedia is 1963. All right. So let's see. How many more pages of this do we have? Okay. So we're going to finish out part two with this. And then part three, we're going to end it out with the last good stuff they got about boxing this encyclopedia. All right. Continuing on. Other weight divisions. Besides the heavyweight class, which includes any weight over 175 pounds, professional boxing recognizes seven other weight classes. All right, so y'all go back and look at those original eight weight classes videos and all those other videos everybody else put out, Boxing Beats and Rhymes and D-Style and Blood and all you other great boxing scholars out there. Okay, seven other weight classes. The names and weight limits of these classes are as follows. Fly weight. 112 pound, bantam weight, 118 pound, feather weight, 126 pound, light weight, 135 pound, welter weight, 147 pound, middle weight, 160 pound, and light heavy weight, 175 pound. So all these other weight classes you see, this is another side note, 168, 140, uh, uh, 122, 132, are, these are added these are the added codified weight classes those are the added catch weights so we don't need catch weights no more we already got added catch weights with weight classes like 168 and 140 and 154 we're, we already got them anywho continuing on over the years competition in the lighter classes has been decidedly more active but less publicized than that in the heavyweight division basing the selections largely on the number of years they held their titles. Other famous boxers in the lighter weight divisions have been Jimmy Wilde, Flyweight, Jimmy Berry, Kid Williams, Pete Herman, Emmanuel Ortiz, Bantamweights, George Dixon, Abe Attell, Johnny Kilbane, Willie Pep, and Kid Bassett, Featherweights, Jack McAuliffe, Jack McAuliffe, Frank Earn, Joe Gans, Freddie Welsh, Benny Leonard, Tony Conzaneri, Barney Ross, and Lou Ambers. Lightweights, Kid McCoy, Joe Walcott. Bar this is talking about Barbados Joe Walcott, y'all. Remember, there's two Joe Walcotts. This is Barbados Joe Walcott. Jack Britt, Mickey Walker, Barney Ross, and Henry Armstrong. Welterweights, Jack Dempsey, Jack Nonpareil Dempsey. There's two Jack Dempsey's too. This is the welterweight Dempsey. Jack Nonpareil Dempsey. Bob Fitzsimmons, Stanley Ketchel, Billy Popkin, Johnny Wilson, Harry Grell. Man, Bob Fitzsimmons was a welterweight too? There might be another Bob Fitzsimmons. And mind you, y'all, some of these dudes I never heard of. I never heard of Johnny Wilson, never heard of Billy Popkin. Anyway, continuing on, Harry Greb, Mickey Walker again, Tony Zell, 
Carmen Basilio, and Sugar Ray Robinson. Middleweights. Philadelphia Jack O'Brien, Jack Dillon, Batlin Levinsky, Tommy Laughrin, Maxi Rosenblum, Gus Lesenvich, and Archie Moore. Light heavyweights. All right, y'all, now you're going to see some of these pictures of these dudes. Some of them look goofy. Some of them look crazy. Some of them look unbelievable. Some of them look like boxers. All right? And when I was looking at them and doing the research, shout out to Talib. Thanks for helping do that. Uh, a lot of these dudes were real ambiguous. Like, you look at their pictures and you see the names, it, their ethnicity and their race was real ambiguous. Y'all are probably looking at it now. And deeper research a lot of these dudes these are their stage names or their american names so to speak such as um look back in this list such as um such as johnny wilson and um billy popkate you know, a lot of these dudes use i guess like uh newfound names or whatever you want to call them you know crossover names you know, names to be more comfortable for the public, to be easier accepted, and all that good stuff. And a lot of fighters do that. All right, so that ends part two, y'all. Tell us what you think. Uh, we're going to end part three out. And remember, y'all, this is as, as, as of 1963, so they're naming these great fighters as of 1963. All right? So that's why you, you only hear certain people. See, a lot of y'all probably don't know who George Dixon Little Chocolate is. A lot of you probably do. And people such as Pete Herman and Manuel Ortiz. I know we all heard of Willie Pep, Joe Gans, Freddie Wilk, Benny Leonard. See, these are the great fighters as of 1963. All right? So, I, we didn't hear Ali's name. Um, um, who, who else? And Ali was already the world heavyweight champion in 1960. Well, what other names did we, we didn't hear? I'm trying to think. Well, we heard Greg Walker, Sugar Ray, uh, Armstrong. Uh, we didn't hear Fritzy Civic at Welter. Well, anyway, uh, there's a lot of greats that left out because history hasn't got to that point yet. But let me start rambling. All right, y'all, stay tuned for part three. We love Bolson.